Sapphires are blue. The casserole dish I just bought last week is blue. My friend Miriam said the letter B is blue. And I remember his eyes are blue. Like the aquamarine. In blue, you see both simplicity and complexity. It contains a vast but unknown land. We explore the uncertainty. We touch the blue. Okay, this is the sea and sunlight's falling onto that water, right? The red, the green, and the blue, okay? What happens when this falls on the water is the water molecules are very good at absorbing red light. So they, what the water molecules can do really well is knock out the red light, take it away. So that with the light that you see when you're in water is like this. All the red light's gone away. There's very little red light left. There's more of the blue and green light. In fact, even some of the green light's taken away. And what's left coming through into the water is mostly blue, right? And some green, but most of the red's gone away. Very little, maybe one little bit of red coming through, right? That makes the water, as you see it, blue. And that's because the red light has been wiped out. So any light that's left underwater is mostly blue. Well, the color is quite complicated, as I'm sure you're aware. Artists don't necessarily always use color in quite a self-conscious way, although the three artists we look at use color in certain ways. But it's important to remember that color is kind of bound together with the other elements of an artist's work. And you can't always that easily just extract color from the other elements of their thinking. Um, and the other thing to point out is about the broader history of modern art. So prior to the late 19th century, um, colour in art doesn't have the same sort of autonomy that it has in the art of Matisse or Chagall. So prior to the late 19th century, colour might be used to depict the local colour of objects by representing, and I'm talking about Western art here mainly. Well, in the case of Chagall, um, he's quite an interesting figure in the sense that he grew up in the Thebes. In the 1920s, he moves to the south of France. Um, likely that blue would have taken on a greater salience once he went to the Riviera and experienced that much more intense blue-white that you get in the south of France. Blue also has a certain kind of spiritual quality in uh, Chagall's work as well. Um, as is known, he was a Jewish artist there's something about the kind of slightly magical fairy story type quality with these little floating figures, um, more sort of mystical variant of Judaism in the 19th century that was kind of looked down on as a bit kind of backward by the more sort of sophisticated Jews who'd moved to other places. There's something a bit suffocating about the use of blue. 
um, especially in some of the works that you mentioned where the blue has this kind of, because blue can obviously be quite ethereal, but it can also be quite dense and suffocating if it's a certain kind of blue, like a very dense ultramarine. Um, Blue is the colour the wind leaves the world after it takes a glance of it. It is the gloomy rationality left in a person when other emotions are removed. Just like the man in a case portrayed by Anton Chekhov. He wouldn't be a part of the happy ending. But he also wouldn't die of a shot ringing out. When I close my eyes and start to think about blue, an elephant comes to my mind. He is small. It's a small elephant. Blue is often considered a cool, relaxing color, right? Um, which it is to us, but to physicists, blue is, is actually the opposite. Right? Blue is a hot. Blue means high energy. And that's because blue has a, a wavelength of light that corresponds to higher energy. Mm -hmm. But our eyes change that because our eyes are not sensitive to certain kinds of light. Um, and that makes, I think our eyes, if I remember right, our eyes are most sensitive in the yellow, green, slightly blue end of the spectrum. So we see blue things better than we see red things. Uh, and that changes the view of, of what the object looks like. An object that may look, if you took a picture of it with a telescope, it would look pretty white. When you look at it, it might look a little blue because we see more of the blue and a little less of the red light in that object. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So our view of the world is also biased by our eye. Our eye is not the perfect instrument that we think it is. Um, and we tend to see a little more blue as a consequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matisse is less interested in symbolic aspects of colour and he's more interested in colour as a form of expression but also colour as a form of structure. And Matisse in the, in the sort of 1900s becomes dissatisfied with this use of painting, this use of colour and he wants to use colour in a way that is divorced from not just representing the world but also colour as a way of actually structuring the picture, like colour can be structure and not just perspective or linear arrangement or drawing. But also, of course, he went to uh, Nice uh, around about the First World War and he stayed there in the 1920s. And interestingly, that period where he would have been exposed to that intense light of the Riviera, and Matisse also came from the north of France, he came from a little town near the border with Belgium, but of course it's not quite so sunny. So of course he would have felt that intensity of color when he went to the south of France, given that as he grew up, he was used to sort of grayer skies. So that color would have had an impact on his work. Perhaps the blue sort of sums up the kind of 
coloristic intensity that is part of Matisse's wife's work. Um, but it also has a kind of spiritual overtone as well. So perhaps there's also an element of that too, the blue having the spiritual meaning to him at that stage in his life as he's getting older, he's reflecting on his mortality um, and so forth. So I think it's bound up with his broader interest in color throughout his career, but it's also about that, I think that stage in his life, uh, late in his life when he makes the cutouts and he makes this breakthrough of working in color in quite a direct way. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without trying to. Blue is the tenderness flowing through the heart burned by sorrow. Blue is the elegant and unyielding soul fighting against the devil. It is the snow mountain, the frozen soil, the sea fall, the dust all over the sky the dust which covers everything. Point at something you can see. stars are the ones that correspond to the hottest, often the biggest stars. They are burning very bright, they're, they're making a lot of energy, which, uh, which keeps their surface hot and blue, that's where most of their light comes out. That's a different take how you think about the colors for a physicist. Uh, one of my favorite is actually Rigel. It's a blue, what's called a blue supergiant. And it's so bright that it actually makes the rest of the area in the sky around it, if you take a very deep image with a telescope, you find these patches of blue around it, which is reflecting light. Uh, there's a very beautiful blue reflection nebula next to Rigel. Uh, it's called the Witch's Head Nebula, because it, it looks, like, looks like the face of a witch, you know, like a classic uh, fairy tale witch with a, with a hooked nose and big open mouth. And whenever you see the Witch's Head Nebula, you know that Rigel is nearby. Because the light that you see from the Witch's Head Nebula reflects the light from Rigel itself. Okay, so Klein is quite an unusual case because he is a very different sort of artist, either Chagall or Matisse. So what he's doing is he's playing on the language of transcendence, the language of blue, suggesting the beyond, suggesting the immaterial. So the blue takes on the form of a kind of a, a signifier, you could say, where it might signify profundity or the immaterial, but that's no longer connected to what we think the artist might mean or what he's doing. And I think it's important also to think about the different context that he's working in the late 1950s, 
by which time modernism has really started to change quite significantly. Klein is on the cusp of what we later call postmodernism. So, so that kind of patenting of international Klein blue, so he actually patented that color. I mean, again, he's also playing on the notion of the artistic genius. So that, that, that shift in artistic practice that I mentioned, that artists are now conceiving of themselves in different ways, almost like a business person or a showman. And Klein's patenting of blue is part of that changed role of the artist. So that's really starting to change in the 60s. And we see that with Warhol as well and um, the other sort of practices that emerged in that period. Blue is a remembrance between night and dawn. Blue is a shining loneliness. Blue is the wind with no name. Blue is the continuous flow in the fragmented world. Touch the universe. Touch the blue. 